Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the intersection of cannabis, the capital markets, and culture. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg of KCSA Strategic Communications speak with the business leaders, financial experts, cultural icons, legislators, and generally interested people moving the cannabis industry forward. This week, Lewis and special guest host, KCSA intern Jason Schwartz, are chatting with Ted Lichtenberger, CEO of Flower Co., a quote-unquote big-box retailer of cannabis that is bringing wholesale marijuana prices directly to consumers. Ted will chat with our hosts about why he thinks Flower's business model is suited to thrive in the modern cannabis economy, what he is seeing from consumer behaviors in the California marijuana market, and how his background at McKinsey has prepared him for success in the industry. Now on to our interview with Lewis, Jason, and Ted. Hello, everybody. Thanks for taking a moment to listen to The Green Rush. Anne and I really appreciate it. And this week, it is uh, just me alone. Well, actually, not completely alone. This week, I'm joined by an intern here at KCSA named Jason Schwartz. Jason's been working here for the summer um, and is a big fan of the podcast. And as a, a thank you, uh, I let him sit in with me as, as I chatted with Ted Lichtenberg, CEO of Flower & Company. Um, we're recording this on Friday, August 9th, and one of the coolest things about this industry is it never ceases to throw you a curveball. A few weeks ago, we interviewed Liz Kruger, state senator from New York, about what was going on and why the, the New York state attempt to get adult use just flamed out. And in that conversation, we talked about New Jersey as well, which also flamed out. Turns out maybe it didn't flame out so badly. Um, a story came out today, like I said, on August 9th, and you can find it on the patch or, or pretty much anywhere um, around saying that um, New Jersey State Senator Steve Sweeney said that lawmakers may make another run at bringing adult use legislation um, to a vote in New Jersey, uh, possibly between Election Day um, in November and January, which would be amazing. And Phil Murphy, the governor who ran on on legalization uh, for adult use, said he's fully behind it, um, which would be, as a New Jersey resident, as a, a participant in the cannabis industry, just a really good thing. And, you know, I've argued now for a couple of years that as goes New Jersey, so will go the rest of the country. Because if you think about it from a dominoes effect, New Jersey sits between New York State, between Pennsylvania, and then you've got D.C., Maryland, down south. You are going to see uh, all of those states. You will see New York quickly react to a New Jersey bill. You will see Pennsylvania probably quickly move to an adult use state. You will see Maryland go from a, a very good medical program probably then to an adult use state and it will just spread west um and this is a good thing you know the 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 quicker that these states pass adult use legislation and especially states like pennsylvania and ohio which historically have been more conservative uh, that can only be a good thing in terms of getting federal action on bills like the states act or the fair banking act so that's 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 all I really wanted to talk about. Um, I think you're going to find the upcoming conversation with Ted from Flower Company really interesting. Um, you know, historically, historically, I mean, this industry is not that old from a public or capital markets or investment perspective. But for the last five or six years, you have not seen traditional Silicon Valley investors get involved in the industry. And Ted's company, Flower Co., which he is building out to be a big box retailer, akin to a Sam's Club or a Walmart or Costco, came through a traditional technology incubator called Y Combinator. That, to my knowledge, has not happened in the cannabis industry before. And what Ted is building is really absolutely fascinating. So I think you're going to find this conversation as interesting as I did. Now on to my conversation and Jason Schwartz's, our intrepid intern's conversation with Ted Lichtenberg, CEO of Flower Company. 
thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time this afternoon. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, you know, before we get into what Flower Company is or Flower Co. is, I, you know, you yourself are a, a really fascinating person, right? You know, your background is not as a traditional cannabis market entrant, and you're younger than a lot of people who are new to the industry. Um, you have you, you spent three years at one of the biggest consulting companies in the world, McKinsey. Um, you you kind of fit into the same way I do into the you know the suit category, you know, and there's this tension between suits and stoners. Um, what is your personal cannabis story? How did how did Ten Lichtenberger get to be you know a major player in the California cannabis market? Yeah, so unlike um, a lot of people who you know uh, I meet in the market, I actually never uh, dealt or sold before getting in the industry. I've been a, a long time consumer. Um, I grew up in Virginia, and, and I you know access there was pretty poor. But when I moved out to California um, uh, after uh, graduating um, from school, I was immediately struck by how um, how much better the experience was in Cali. I got a medical card within days and um, enjoyed just as a consumer seeing the evolution that was starting to happen um, even back in, in 2012. What was your what was your excuse? What was your medical excuse for the card? Well, at, at McKinsey, you have a lot of stress, and <laughs> uh, so it didn't didn't take much uh, to get to, to to get a card there. But I also, you know, I've I've had um, I'm a pretty active person. I've had some sports injuries, so I had a, I had a soldier surgery, and I've actually found um, you know, cannabis to be really helpful, not just as a recreational thing um, that I enjoy, but also from a medical standpoint for pain relief. Um, I ended up, um, you know, later on actually just like this past. Uh, at the end of the summer, I got hit by a cement truck and herniated a bunch of discs when it rear-ended oh me. Oh, God. And so, yeah, that was brutal. Hey, <laughs> you survived getting hit by a cement truck. I mean, that is unbelievable. So Yeah, so but now I'm, I'm a huge fan of just, like, using uh, Mary's Medicinals, uh, like, gel sticks on my back. And so I, I fully believe in the, the medical side as well. But, you know, I, I, you know, back then I was primarily focused on it from a rec standpoint. And... Um, as I was seeing the the market start to evolve a little, a little bit, I was, I was really excited, um, but still f was kind of confused by the fact that I, I just wasn't learning as much about the maker, about who was actually producing the flowers that I was enjoying. And uh, you know, this was before there was prepackaged flour. This was back when flour was being sold into dispensaries um, in the in, you know, in a duffel bag, and so. Um, uh, when I, you know, after, after a couple of years at McKinsey, I was really itching to get back into building, um, companies before McKinsey, I'd helped launch an eyewear business, um, uh, and just kind of caught the entrepreneurial bug. And, um, I got really lucky. I got connected. Um, I just reached out to everybody I knew and asked them for help getting connected into the cannabis industry. Um, and I was actually looking at cannabis and virtual reality at the time and I ended up um, eventually, one of the people who I connected with on the VR side uh, ended up being my, one of my co-founders for Flower Company now because we, we stayed in the loop and he saw my the crazy kind of adventures and, and uh, journey I was taking and eventually got hooked. But um, on the cannabis side, I got really lucky and I got connected with a longtime cultivator and a longtime criminal defense attorney up in Humboldt County. And they... Um, you know the, the stories they told me of how that community had come together um, to uh, defend itself in you know, collective civil disobedience um, uh, to protect that industry and to use that the, the cannabis industry to build a community there was really compelling to me. And um, I, I dove in headfirst to help um, uh, build a path to market um, for you know the legacy weed basket of America to enter this this emerging regulated space. And I just hit the ground running. So I, um, I think I drove almost 100,000 miles in my first two years in the industry. And while all, I all all in California, all in California. And oh, while, man. while I, you know, you know have a uh, more you know, traditional suit background, as you described, I definitely um, did my did my time, put put my work in, and um, built relationships across the state by uh, just um, not being afraid to do anything in the industry in terms of you know, any, any different type of job and 
um, just figure out what's happening in the market and try to meet these unmet needs. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm a, a stoner suit, you could say. <laughs> I think everybody who's a, who's a suit in the industry is also a, a stoner too. And, you know, the, I use that, that word, you know, a bit pejoratively. I mean, an historic market participant who had been in the illicit side, you know, what you're building and we'll get into the, the, like the mechanics of flower co, you know, it's being positioned as like a big box retailer, like a warehouse club, um, for, for cannabis. And when I think BJ's or Sam's clubs, you know, I tend to think massive bricks of toilet paper, you know, huge things of tissues and like just big stuff. Can you explain the concept of what you guys are building? Like how does it actually functionally work? Yeah. So flower company, um, has both a membership model and a non-member model. Um, but members are getting the best, the best deals. So our members pay $120 a year to get weed delivered to their door for half the price of the dispensary. And, um, in East Bay and Sacramento, we've, um, gotten that delivery time down to two day delivery. So, um, you're, you know, you're, you're saving, uh, waiting a little to save a lot. And, um, we're rolling that same delivery um, time across the rest of the markets we're in, including L.A., um, San Francisco uh, and Humboldt County uh, over the next uh, month or two. And so what that means is you know, customers can um, log on to our menu and um, uh, pick uh, from an array of some of the leading brands and uh, by um, uh, uh waiting and ordering at a pre-scheduled time versus um, rushing and having needing it in 30 minutes, um, we're able to be a lot more efficient. And we pass those savings along uh, fully to the customer. Uh, so we're really making money on membership there. So let me ask, uh, well, I'm going to ask, you don't have to give me permission. I'm just going to ask um, two things, the two day versus delivery, uh, you, you know, at, there are there are delivery services like Ease and Chill and others in California that you know they're they're there within an hour at the lo- at the longest two hours. How do you how do you compete against them? Is it a different customer base? You know, is it an education thing? Like, okay, you're a big edibles guy, you want to order us when you're down to like a quarter left in your your tin of of plus or you know Kiva. How do you educate the customer to make sure that they understand the fundamental difference between, you know, a just-in-time delivery service versus a pre-planned delivery service? Yeah, you know, I think that um, it's really important to remember that folks had similar doubts for early e-commerce. Um, you know, people didn't believe folks would want to wait for deliveries or order online through Amazon as an example. But by delivering, you know, cost savings and wider variety, um, they've been able to really win the market. And we believe that, um, you know, customers are willing to wait as long as they're um, getting some value for it. Um, And, you know, when I, when I look at the market today, most of it is still being serviced um, by the, uh, you know, the illicit uh, you know, legacy market. Most customers are purchasing there. It's still you know, three or four times as big as the regulated industry in California in particular. And the patterns that people have there um, are uh, much more likely to be uh, you know, scheduling time for your, uh, your dealer to come deliver than them rushing to get to you in the next 30 minutes. And so, um, you know, we we understand that there's there's some moments where you just need it in a pinch, um, and we're not the best uh, place to purchase in that moment. But if you can plan ahead a little bit um, and um, uh, order ahead of time, um, you can buy almost twice as much. And for our members, um, that means that uh, you know they're able to buy ounces for fifty nine dollars and wow. uh, you know raw garden cartridges for like the half gram for nineteen bucks and the full gram one for thirty I think it's thirty two dollars on our menu right now which is crazy it's like you know it's it's the best deal you can you can find and so uh, when when you when you're buying a you know thousand dollars or two thousand dollars of 
cannabis every year really adds up. You, you know, you're basically burning money if you're not buying from Flower Co. That was, I mean, you just made the argument literally for the difference between ordering a pizza that moment versus going grocery shopping for your, your week's food. I mean, that's literally the fundamental argument, which is absolutely brilliant. Well done. You've, you have solved a huge problem in, in the industry. How do you curate the brands that you stock? How do you decide who gets, for argument's sake, shelf space? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's one that we've grappled with um, because we um, we have something a little different than uh, most of the delivery services. Other people are picking and packing from the trunk of a car or from a crowded room in a warehouse um, that they're running deliveries out of um, uh, near or in a dispenser they're running deliveries out of um, in the city that they're delivering to. Um, and the, the space restrictions that that causes um, means that their ability to have a very deep menu, a broad menu, uh, is, is more limited. They can, they can only stock so many things in the trunk of a car. Whereas we, because we're picking and packing our orders in a warehouse, can really be the everything store of cannabis. We can have a, a long tail uh, of different types of products. Um, but we're, we're also really about um, saving our customers uh, money and giving them the best deal they can get anywhere. And so uh, we don't want to you know, spread our, our purchasing um, across too many vendors as we're you know, running out of the gate. So you know, right now what we're doing is uh, we're focusing on uh, working with people that are high functioning, that are professional, <laughs> that have good reputations in the industry, that have really high quality products easy to work with so that we can um, you know be as efficient as possible and pass those savings to the customers and um, as we see products uh, on the market that are interesting or niches that other dispensaries aren't servicing as as well as um, uh, the customers want you know for example in the wellness area there's certain products that people um, are you know, really seeking out and just don't have access to that we can put on the menu um, uh, we, we, we are kind of curating that. And as we continue to grow, our menu is just going to get deeper and deeper, um, as, as we have more purchasing power. Um, are, in terms of the business model, is it, is it consignment or are you buying in bulk and, and carrying the costs of the inventory? Yeah. So I, um, when, when I, when I got in the industry, um, I first uh, created, uh, worked on creating the, this brand, Humboldt Legends, um, and then I also helped to co-found and spin out um, a, a brand called Old Pal. And I sold both of those brands um, B2B to dispensaries as well as delivery services um, around California. And what I learned from that experience is that you really need to be invested in a long-term partnership with your brands and understand what their business economics are in order to have a you know good partnership. Um, and that's informed a lot of the way that we've developed the Flower Co. model. So rather than um, uh, you know, take product on consignment um, or you know, even um, just the choice of using credit cards versus not using credit cards, uh, is those sort of decisions are all viewed through the lens of having long-term partnerships that work for the brands. Um, on the credit card front, we had a you know, three-month period where one of our biggest suppliers uh, or purchasers partners had their credit card processing all got held up. So they didn't pay us for a few months and we had to pay our vendors and it was really tricky. And so we were, we're just using cash on the Flower Coast side because we don't want to put our vendors in that same situation. So no, we, we pay um, on... Uh, on terms, um, uh, it varies a little bit by vendor to vendor, um, but it's not consignment. We take responsibility for the decisions that we make to purchase product and um, you know, own any mistakes of ordering too much inventory or um, uh, you know, things along those lines. So you know, we think it's the responsibility of everybody in this industry to, to manage their, um, you know, their AR and uh, pay folks and be responsible for the decisions they make. Though we also understand that there's a lot of liquidity challenges out there and, and issues pop up. So, you know, uh, just because someone's a little late, you don't always freak out with them. But, um, 
just I think it's really important that everybody has a mentality of holding themselves accountable for the decisions they're making and trying to create partnerships that aren't just getting you a great deal, but are sustainable for everybody involved. Just to remind everybody, we're talking with Ted Lichtenberger, CEO of Flower Co. Ted, I'm going to let um, Jason Schwartz, who is brand new to the podcast and making his both debut and swan song for right now, ask a question because he's been dying to. Okay. Hello, Ted. Jason here. So my question for you is pricing models are meticulous and brands positioning themselves at the higher end probably, in my opinion, would want to maintain a certain price point for their consumers for the sake of consistency. So how have brands responded to you when they find out that their product is now going to be available to customers at a much lower price point? Yeah, so, you know, channel conflict is a issue in a lot of industries. And um, it's really understandable that brands um, can get some pushback uh, um, at first when, um, when, you know, deep, when other dispensaries see the pricing that we're offering, you know, our, our prices are shockingly low. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of tools, um, that we, we give those brands to help them in those conversations. Um, you know, we are charging folks uh, a membership fee in order to have access to that pricing and our non-member pricing, um, is, is much closer to retail. Um, so, uh, there's there's a you know, there's a paywall between customers and actually getting that product, uh, which has uh, helped a lot of brands kind of talk this through. But the other thing that we'll we'll do when brands are are facing more resistance on that front is develop um, unique skews skew, with them. Uh, so we've done variety packs of cartridges, as an example, where we had um, two or three cartridges in um, in a in a package in order to. Um, a bundle it up more more similar to if you were in a uh, you know a wholesale grocery store buying that giant thing of um, uh, pretzels um, and we've done the same thing with flour um, partners where we've purchased um, flour and turned them into you know ounce flour bags so you know going bulk is one way to do it or a variety packs is another way to do it to help um, those brands in those conversations but I think it's also important for everyone to recognize that we're, we're not here to, um, uh, I, I don't view our biggest competitors as the existing retailers and dispensaries, to be honest. Um, I view our competitors as the, uh, you know, the, the illicit market. And um, when we look at our customer base, um, a you know, very large percentage of them are coming from having uh, been buying from the illicit market before and uh, making the switch to to use us. And so um, being able to share that type of data with stores has also helped um, those conversations uh, for the brand partners. You birthed the company in part out of your time at Y Combinator, which is one of the, the best known business accelerators in Silicon Valley. How is Silicon Valley looking at the cannabis industry now? I mean, you know, I've not heard of a lot of companies who are being incubated at, you know, Andrews and Horowitz or any of the other Sand Hill Road VCs. So why Y Combinator? What did you learn? And what is Silicon Valley looking at at the industry like? Which is a lot to unpack. Yeah, so uh, I think it's pretty exciting that Y Combinator is leading the charge um, for the Sil Silicon Valley uh, getting more um, into the cannabis industry. And while we are um, you know, one of the more uh, successful cannabis companies to come through YC, um, there've actually been, uh, there, there, there were one or two before us and there was another one in our batch. And in this current batch, uh, which is going to be um, uh, presenting um, in uh, later, later in August, I think it's August 18th or 19th, um, they're, they're actually a, a couple of YC companies that are, are cannabis companies, um, two of which I've um, helped to advise a little bit and um, share some of the learnings I've had from the industry, uh, which is really exciting to be able to, to, to support other people. Um, but, you know, what I, what I think everybody realizes is uh, this is going to be a massive industry and that the timing is, is really now to participate in shaping 
um, the the face of it for the future. Uh, I think there's a lot of different things that have um, uh, nudged, kind of uh, nudged the, them and other venture groups to uh, kind of perk up and pay attention now. Um, it's you know, from from when I got in the industry to now, we went from being in the wild west, no rules really, you know, the collective model 215 to highly regulated and metric is coming online across the state right now. Those sort of things give people confidence that they're not going to, um, you know, have uh, a lot of you know, you know risk mm -hmm. from a, a, a legal standpoint, and that's that's incredibly important. But then, secondly, just the the big shifts internationally around uh, capital markets and um, increased uh, uh, legal um, or deprohibition in other countries, um, I think it's just caused everybody to realize that uh, this is not um, the cat's out of the bag and. This isn't going to be rolled back, so uh, folks are starting to to try to try to participate and take advantage of of this moment. Can you talk about funding capital markets, where all this fits in with you guys? Because um, you 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 really are a unique player in the space, and I'm you know having come out of Y Combinator, where some of the biggest other company like Airbnb is a Y Combinator graduate. I think Uber is a graduate. You know, how are people looking at you guys from an investment perspective? Yeah, so it's it's changed a little bit. Um, when starting, you know, in, in 2016, the types of people that would invest in the industry were much more likely to be individual angels um, or family offices um, writing checks. And um, over the last 18 months, there's been a real um, groundswell of um, traditional venture capital um, uh, starting to investigate, if not invest, in the industry. Um, some of the tr some traditional venture is investing, um, and uh, there's also been this explosion of cannabis um, uh, venture or cannabis funds popping up that are concentrated on understanding this industry and have developed confidence in their their LP pool that they can can navigate it effectively and so uh, it's been it's been pretty eye opening to see uh, the size of some of the deals that have happened recently through cannabis focused uh, funds and uh, I think it will um, be interesting to see how um, different funds models play out because um, those those the, the the cannabis focused funds are uh, typically taking a slightly different tact than uh, traditional venture you know traditional venture will make bets on companies in um, industries sometimes they'll focus on industries um, but it's rare that they will have um, their port they, they will design their investments to create portfolios that can roll up or design investments um, uh, to um, uh, with with such a desire of creating channels for other parts of their investments and so it's 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 uh, in some ways a, a similar to uh, uh, you know a private equity model but still yep. with with like a venture, Face, um, they they're not coming in saying they're doing PE, but they're it's a it's a kind of more of a PE type world. These are the guys like Cresco and Merida, you know the 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 all the guys that we we talk with. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that that's that's good because their um, uh, their models and their their capital give you know, certain certain entrepreneurs really want that type of capital and want to have that path towards roll-ups or um, uh, be able to leverage the uh, the, the other um, partnerships and within that portfolio. You know, it, what most people don't realize, even when they're starting in you know, businesses in this industry, is that um, everybody is kind of a startup. It's a very immature industry, even though it's uh, been around for a very long time, um, in the sense that regulations are shifting um, fundamental technology um, for processing, for extraction, for pro production of products are shifting. And that means that 
just because somebody is signing a contract saying they're going to do something for you doesn't mean that they're you know they've really got tight SOPs to do it or a ton of experience. And so um, being able to lean on um, and trust another uh, portfolio from uh, you know company as a partner um, f- from your your investor uh, can be really valuable. And um, I I think that. Um, it's it'll be good to have um, or it's just it's good to have the capital markets opening more there and yep. um, having different types of partners coming in to fund you. You know, most most companies that are funded out of Silicon Valley from a, a traditional VC, they have a goal towards a public offering. Right. You know, whether it's 18 months or 36 months or longer. Is that what you guys are looking at? Is that is it, are you looking at a traditional IPO on the Nasdaq? Are you going to wait until uh, the U.S. gets its act together and you can access those markets, or would you look to the Canadian markets like everybody else has? You know, three years ago, one of the biggest problems, not just the regulation, uh, but uh, one of the other biggest problems for uh, you know investors to get in the industry was. When I when am I gonna be able to get out? When am I gonna make my money off the deal? <laughs> and so yeah. I remember like the number of times that came up in pitches um, was astonishing to me because I was like, well, I'm I'm just starting to build this thing. Like we're gonna figure out how to sell it if we're making something valuable. Um, but it was a real concern then because there were not clear paths or precedents of um, of exits. And so um, you know I I think that it's um, as for, from an investor standpoint. It is really good news that there are these paths to liquidity, either through public offerings in Canada um, or sale to acquisitive um, you know, public companies elsewhere, or bigger uh, multi-state operators. Um, uh, those are good things. Um, I'm I'm not obsessed about a specific outcome for an exit. I am trying to build a business that is. Um, able to create a lot of value, and I think that uh, you know if we're if we're executing on delivering affordable um, and best prices to customers and, and giving members better and better recommendations on their products, that we're going to be building um, an increasingly um, deep moat. And whether the the, the federal you know, regulatory like regulatory shift allows us to do a public offering in the U.S. or um, we access capital markets in other places. I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't have a crystal ball for that one. But I I'm pretty confident that if we continue to do what we're doing and execute, um, we'll be in a good position to choose from those different options as they open up. Cool. Uh, well, first of all, hearing that you you want to build it and run it and not immediately sell it. Um, is great generally, um, and it's like that's what the a true entrepreneur does. It's like they want to build something. It's not build it towards an exit. It's just I want to build something. Um, just to remind everybody, we're talking with Ted Lichtenberger, CEO of Flower Co. Okay, that's enough about the capital markets. Let's 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 have a little more fun, um, kind of talking about what you're doing in California because you're right now. You are a California only company right now, um, but I my assumption is you've looked at the the U.S. cannabis market writ large. You've looked at what's going on in in Massachusetts or Maine or or Washington or Oregon. What makes California such an attractive market by itself, and what di- what's different about what's going on in California than say Colorado? Yeah, so um, right now when I look out at the rest of the country. There's a couple of different like archetypes of, of markets. You have markets like Colorado that have had um, cannabis for enough time um, for their market to mature somewhat. Um, I think in you know Colorado, it's it's pretty stable who the players are. Um, while there's you know there's some shift that um, is happening, it's 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 relatively stable model where the there's regula- regulations that have been there for a bit and. Um, uh, there, you know, another example would be you know, Arizona. Um, in both of those places, there's not um, monopolization um, through a, you know, by a very small number of shops. Um, it's it's kind of a mature and relatively competitive open market. And then you have places like Massachusetts where it's not mature. There's not enough supply yet. 
And it's clear that there will be more supply turning online in the future, um, and that it, it'll be a, a you know somewhat open market. But um, it's it's going through its kind of you know, early early days right now. Um, and then you have you know other markets where it's really restrictive. There's you know, very few licenses issued, um, and the you know, highly capitalized folks are are going to you know be dominating it. You know places like Florida. Um, where there's you know there's limited licensing. Now wait till wait till Texas comes online. Can you imagine what that state's going to be like? Yeah, I mean exactly. And so um, I I think that all of those different types of markets are um, things that are going to exist within the U.S. for some period of time, um, but they're not permanent. Eventually, I'm I'm pretty. Um, I pretty strongly believe that we will have open, you know, sales across states, across the country, and because of that, um, I um, I've been focused on um, you know the California market where there's a massive market bigger than any of the other states. The existing commercial operations um, mean that there's enough supply to meet demand and more though there are seasonal and sometimes regulatory shocks as new you know, rec- testing requirements go into place um, temporarily. Um, and uh, it's also just a place where brands outside of cannabis have been built and has a lot of influence across the world um, from a pop culture standpoint. So you know, when, I, when I look at all those markets, uh, California is, a, is an obvious place to launch first. It's delivery friendly and um, while the regulations are, are still shifting a bit, uh, it's a it's a it's a regulatory environment that encourages um, innovation in cannabis. Um, but I, I expect that other markets, like even you know with Colorado, um, they th- these markets that are that are out there that have been ma- been maturing uh, but haven't had delivery. I, I think all of those markets are going to start to turn delivery on because customers just want that. It's convenient. Um, whether you get it in 30 minutes or two days, you're happier. Many people are happier getting it delivered um, than going into the store. I mean, just me for clothing, I hate going into stores. <laughs> I buy everything online, and, and I think the same thing is driving folks to um, push for delivery. And in Colorado, um, they're uh, in the process of you know, developing delivery um, regulation, um, and uh, we, I, I believe, that will roll out to other states. So we're focused. You know, on California first, um, we're we have our eye on places like Colorado um, and other places like um, Oregon as well, where the market is pretty open uh, for delivery um, and is you know an, a a, uh, a place we could launch um, uh, next. Um, but we're not uh, obsessed with the need to break into places that are super monopolized um, and uh, don't have a developed um, amount of supply yet, because if you don't have enough supply to actually supply the market, it's hard for our model to work. Our model works best when we're able to buy on an open market and then resell to the customers. So I think that the flower company is doing something really different from any other provider of cannabis products. And what I want to ask is, is the goal for the future to expand to more states or to expand to a larger share of customer? because there are other ancillary products to cannabis, such as growing supplies, perhaps snacks, smoking accessories, that if you could get, if you could provide these products to customers too, you yeah, could start to compete with You're gonna put a bag of Cheetos with in with every flower, order of, uh, of um, a bud. Right, like if we look at Amazon, for example, they went to an online bookstore when I was a kid to any product you could ever need delivered to you quickly. And now they're a threat, a contender for online streaming streaming services. So what do you see in the future for Flower Company? It's a great question. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, we're constantly making decisions based on not just what we think, but what we test and learn from our customers and what they ask for. And so um, 
uh, I'll share what what I what I think we're, we're we're heading towards, but with the caveat that we are constantly running tests and listening to customers and trying to um, really build what they actually want, not just what we think they want. So, um, you know, what 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 I like about cannabis is the um, the variety of different products, of batches, of uh, the you know different strains from different farms, and What's really cool about our, our model is we have a ton of information on what um, where that product is coming from and have the supply chain to consistently give consumers things that they really enjoyed. So I think that over time, you'll see us adding more variety, getting better and better recommendations going for the customers across that um, deep menu of different cannabis products. Um, but, uh, or I, I would also, you know, expect us to add more, um, accessories, uh, uh, for, for cannabis, but there's some just regulatory restrictions on us adding, uh, things like Cheetos in there, uh, with our orders for now. Uh, though I think, um, that there's some pretty interesting opportunities for that. I, I've joked around, I think it would be awesome to do a, a partnership with Blue Apron where they send uh, brownie mix and we send the oil. Uh, oh, that's but, brilliant. I'm in. Yeah. I'm totally in. Sign me up, please. Let me ask, Ted, let me ask a, a slightly different question. You guys have hundreds of products that you make available to consumers. What's your favorite? My favorite product is our half ounce of smalls. And sometimes I'll pick different flavors for it. What, 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 what is a small? So what a small is, um, when, you, when you think of uh, the, you know, the canvas flower, there's different bud sizes. And um, the market has matured enough that there's grading that's happening in the industry. Um, and there's a consumer preference for the buds that are you know, larger. And uh, they do tend to have a slightly higher potency. Um, uh, because they're, they're getting more of the energy of the plant, but the smaller buds that have been graded out um, aren't um, quite as valuable in the market, but um, I personally find that trade-off uh, to be pretty, uh, a pretty good deal. Um, and I, uh, I think that the, you know, a, a Jack Herrera Smalls um, uh, is, is just, just works great for me. It's funny. I was just listening to... Um... Lizzie Post's book, um, Higher Etiquette, and she talks about, she goes into unbelievably great depth on the different terpenes and what impact that they have and when they're combusted at different levels. And she uses Jack Herrera as an example of a, of a strain that has a lot of lemonine in it. And it's a great strain. So you guys are a data company at your core, right? I mean, you're collecting massive amounts or eventually will be massive amounts of data. And my assumption is you're using AI to, to analyze it. Have you seen any trends in the data that you've been collecting that have surprised you? Well, um, not to, to harp on smalls too much more, <laughs> but we found that other people also like them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's been doing pretty good. Um, but uh, some of the things that have surprised me um, from a, you know, a customer standpoint um, is uh, just how focused people are on the products that they they like to consume. Um, I would have expected a little bit more experimentation across variety, but I've found that people, once they've um, kind of gotten a groove, tend to order the same thing or slight variations on the same thing really consistently. And I think that's um, it's, that's a good thing that people figure out what they want and, and what they like. But I also think that, um, as a, uh, in, in the industry, given how much product change there is constantly, um, that helping to, uh, helping folks explore new products, um, is really important for us to do so that they don't get too stuck. Um, and then additionally, one of the, one of the things that we've seen is, you know, people who will only smoke sativa or only smoke indica or hybrid and are, are more um, specific about that speci that categorization. And while I um, I understand the motivation of that, um, the 
the, the, the fact of the matter is that those categories are pretty bad um, indicators of the actual feeling you're going to get. Um, if you if you check out uh, a Confident Cannabis, um, they have a they have a, a really cool visualization um, called uh, I think it's called Connected, uh, where you can see the mapping of all of the chemical profile of cannabinoids and terpene profiles of tests they've done, and it's just t- clear as day that the in the the tags of sativa indica hybrid out in the general market don't actually correlate with the terpene and cannabinoid profile of the flowers. And so I think that um, it's really important as an industry that we give customers the tools to make decisions um, in, in about products uh, that are, are, you know, are more useful. And so we're working on um, figuring out the best way to bring that same type of terpene cannabinoid information in. Um, uh, but it's, it's a tricky thing to visualize and to communicate for customers. So uh, that's one of, those, one of those thorny problems the industry is facing. And I, I hope that as it matures, we can um, figure out some common language and, and uh, ways of visualizing these things to make it uh, a little bit clearer to customers. In, ter- in terms of experimentation and market research with customers, there's a lot of emphasis on the investments of brands like Constellation and Molson Coors. We know that big alcohol has some skin in the game. The thinking is that cannabis-infused and de-alcoholized be- beverages are going to become a big part of the market. What do you think? Do you promote these products to customers? Do you have any that are customer favorites? Are there any that are worth drinking? Yeah, so I, I personally... I am a flower guy. Um, that's how I started, and everything else is nice, and I love to try them out. But flower is gonna be the thing that I I consume for you know, a long time, and I think a lot of the market is like that, where there's something that they're used to, and um, uh, they're um, uh, gonna stick with it. But it's also important to remember that there's a much there, there there's a lot of people out there that haven't been consuming in the legacy market. And for those types of people, um, the, uh, the, you know, beverage is really attractive. And one of the things that we've done as a country in a really effective way is get people off of smoking, you know, cigarettes and reduce that. And people don't want to start smoking things. And so, um, you know, beverages are a nice alternative to, um, to that. But what's challenging, especially for um, you know for low dose um, beverages um, that are, are are being launched to um, serve that segment of the market, is the uh, metabolization of cannabis is different from alcohol. You know, Constellation is used to selling a product where if you put five percent alcohol in it every time, the person will have the same experience every time, and they might grow a tolerance, but it's it's not um, uh, it's you know they, they will get drunk in a linear way to some degree, um, but with cannabis, uh, if somebody starts to consume a two or four or six milligram um, drink and um, has that um, consistently for you know over the course of a few weeks, that drink will um, or can have you know much limited impact. So I'm really excited about the beverages that are coming out. Um, uh, we, um, we've been, um, uh, enjoying, um, the, uh, some, some yerba mate tea that we've launched on our website, um, from infused, good stuff, uh, yep. From good stuff tonics. And I find that's a really nice one to, to have on a, you know, a day where you're rafting or, um, going swimming at the, the river. Um, but, uh, that's, that's a great product for more of a, a harder core user, uh, higher tolerance to hundred milligram drink. Um, but but then I for the lower milligram side I'm really excited about um, this company called Can um, C A N N uh, really bright uh, founders that have created a tasty tonic drink that I doesn't it doesn't get me high at all because of the the low potency but I still think it tastes great um, and. I wouldn't really drink any other cannabis beverage just for uh, for the flavor, but I, I would I'd recommend that for folks who are looking for a, a low dose 
uh, cannabis beverage. Very cool. Um, how much more time do you have for us? Um, I've got another 15 minutes. Okay, great. Um, we're talking with Ted Lichtenberger, CEO of Flower Company. I want to pivot a little bit more to your experience in entrepreneurship. Um, you know, I, I, I've been a business owner now for 15 years, and I can tell you I have made every mistake there is to possibly make in the book. And there have been a couple times where I was like, oh, shit, I don't know if we're going to come back from this one. But every time we did, we, we came out of it as a stronger organization. Can you talk about some of the mistakes that you've made and the lessons you've learned? Yeah. Um, the mistakes are painful, but yeah, that's but, how you but, look. That's, how, that's you how you learn. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, uh, I went back to, I, I went to, to the University of Virginia for school and I, I went back and was speaking at an entrepreneurship class that I had, had, had gone to that was really in, influential um, for me um, while I was in school. And I was, I was given a talk on what I'd learned and um, I, uh, it, was, it was like 10 slides. Each one was a different mistake, basically. And after I finished making the, 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 the presentation to share with them, I was like, oh, man, this presentation was like a $500,000 presentation. <laughs> um, but that's why I actually learned it. And I'd, I'd been told a lot of those things ahead of time. And, and I, I think it's good to have pattern recognition from the advice you, you, see, you receive. But um, you really need to feel the pain to, to have it stick. So for me, honestly, the biggest mistakes that I've made in this industry have been about inventory risk management and assuming that initial demand from customers would translate into um, a scalable demand. So on the, the first one of just you know inventory risk, um, I, I'm a huge fan of Raw Garden. I, you know, that when you ask me the question of what my favorite product was, I go between the, the you know, the, the half ounce of Smalls for like 25 bucks and the Raw Garden cart for $19. And um, I respect what they've built. But back in 2017, they hadn't, you know, hit the market fully yet. And live resin was a booming thing. <laughs> and the wholesale prices were, you know, $60, $70 a gram. So I was a little bullish on that and I made a lot more than I should have and uh, got stuck holding the bag when Rod Garden launched with you know, $16 half gram carts or not carts, but half gram of uh, live resin. And um, that was really painful because there was, I had much higher inventory um, you know, exposure to that than I should have allowed myself to have before building out the sales channels. Um, and, uh, I should have been a little more attentive to the entrance of, you know, of competitors and gotten out of that position with the commodity faster versus trying to hit the margin that I was originally looking for. And ultimately, um, uh, having to write off, um, more than, uh, more than if I had gotten out earlier. So, uh, that, that lesson though, um, led partially to how, how expensive was that lesson? Uh, it was a couple hundred grand. It was, that was, was a big a couple one. hundred grand between friends. Yeah. <laughs> God, um, the think of what we could do with that today, but what, what it yeah, but, did, but that was it, worth it, right? I mean, it was a worthwhile lesson, wasn't it? It was a worthwhile lesson. It, it taught us a lot about how much risk we take with new products, with launching new things. And, um, it also made me recognize that there's an opportunity to take a segment of the market that is currently priced um, out of proportion with you know the the margin profile um, that it will likely have as it matures and just undercut the market um, on today's pricing, but bring it down to a price that is sustainable at scale and take share. And so you know with Old Pal, we did that last year. And um, I'm not involved with managing that, that company at this point, but when we, we you know, got it off the ground and launched it, it was really exciting to um, have those lessons reap some, some rewards. So 
um, I think net net I'm I'm I'm, I'm plus on that uh that learning um though pretty painful at the time going through y combinator must have been a, a an amazing experience did you find mentors to help guide you to where you are and and you know what what, what would be the best advice that you've gotten from somebody who you look up to as a mentor the best advice i've had from a mentor was that the mentors you have will change over time and you should be attentive to uh, finding people um, who will help you with the new challenges that you're facing not um, just sticking with one person uh, or two people forever um, because uh, you know mentors aren't going to know your business in and out but um, they'll be able to give you um, you know, advice or um, help call call you out on um, places where you're not really um, telling yourself the truth. And so, uh, you know, some of the best ment or mentors that I've had have um, uh, been, um, uh, you know, have dissented and pushed back on ideas that I thought were really great, and by challenging me on them. Um, made them a lot stronger uh, and sometimes helped me just course correct and avoid um, uh, launching things or putting resources into projects that um, uh, weren't um, focused enough. Uh, and that focus is one of the best things that mentors can help you drive towards. Um, I got just a couple more questions. I want to be respectful of your time. As a serial entrepreneur, a guy who's done a, a bunch of different things, how has your tolerance for risk changed as you've gone from, you know, different company to different company and as also as you've gotten older? So I think that my, um, my tolerance for risk has become more measured. I think that any great entrepreneur is actually a, uh, a risk averse person. Um, as an entrepreneur, you're you're taking an incredible risk to build a company that you aren't you know, you don't know ahead of time if you're building something people really want. And so, given you're you know, you're already taking this huge risk, the rest of your job is to move that business forward um, with as you know as measured of risk taking as possible. And so I think when I started, I understood that at a loose level that, you know, let's size tests in a way where failing doesn't cut deep enough to hit bone. Um, but I didn't really get what that meant in a disciplined way. And so, and, and the need to actually have, you know, structure for that in the way you, you run your, your company or even your individual work as, a, as an individual contributor on a team. Mm. And so um, I think that I've become um, more um, tolerant of taking risks that were, um, that, that you know, I previously would have thought as being bigger risks because I'm doing them in a way that controls the downside and defines a test that I can accept that even if we don't have an outcome, that's what we'd like to have ideally. We're going to have some learnings come away from it, um, and the the risk is um, uh, controlled. So, Ted, what would you advise someone looking to get into the industry now? What would you tell them? I think it's still day zero of cannabis. We are... Um, really early days. And so, um, yes, you may have missed the boat in some of the states to be an early license applicant and be given, um, you know, licensing early on in a way that gives you some advantages. Or you may not have the relationships in the industry because you haven't been participating to, um, uh, to launch a brand as quickly um, or whatnot. But there's plenty of green space and every time there's a shift of regulation within a state or, um, you know, I, 
as, as I think we all expect in the future, federal regulatory shift to open things up um, across the country, there's going to be moments where um, supply chains shift dramatically. You know, in California, for example, um, the uh, uh, you know July of 2018 was a big moment that the industry finally started to have prepackaged flour, and it's not that the market um, you know grew a ton. Um, at that moment, it, but there was a, a big shift and a rebalancing of, of who had share of it. And similar things are going to happen over the next six months as metric causes California to shake out. Um, things are going to, um, there's going to be opportunities in the, the next 12 to 18 months as distressed assets pop up, people go out of business. And um, I think it's just important to understand this is a marathon, not a sprint that there's um, opportunity, there's an abundance of opportunities. And um, the, the best way to get in the industry is to, to get in and start to learn, understand where there's pain points, um, not to think that it's a bunch of people that don't know how to do business. Um, come in with respect for the people who've been around for a while. They've done some pretty impressive things and dealt with constraints that others haven't had. And so I think coming in with respect, coming in with a, um, a mentality of trying to really learn and um, being entrepreneurial about the opportunities that um, are continuing to present themselves and creative about thinking of how different market shocks will create those opportunities. Okay. Last question, and then we're going to let you go. Um, if you were to wake up tomorrow and open up the, the Los Angeles Times or the Wall Street Journal, what is the one story that you wish the mainstream media were covering about cannabis? Not about your company, but just about cannabis in general, that they're just getting wrong. What should they be covering? So the thing that got me hooked, as I said at the you know, beginning of this conversation, um, when I was first getting into the industry was the power of the stories of the Humboldt community. Um, hearing about how they'd fell trees across roads to block caravans of, um, of the you know, DEA or whatnot, um, and how they'd go in after raids by um, helicopters without warrants that violated civil rights, and they'd, they'd collect um, accounts of how civil rights had been broken and used that collectively as community to um, have civil overseers put in place between the DEA and um, activity in, in Humboldt. Um, those, those stories got me um, hooked in wanting to help and be part of getting the community from Humboldt to um, be part of the regulated market. Uh, and today, those really strong bonds and of camaraderie are starting to splinter in ways that I think are fascinating and are um, important to talk about. Um, right now, the National Guard is you know, up in Humboldt assisting the sheriff there with um, uh, raids and surveys to um, uh, start to try to uh, tamp down on the unregulated farms. And that's, this is the, you know, one of the first times that that community um, isn't just a bunch of gray dots on a map, but is actually, you know, black dots and white dots, people that are licensed and aren't licensed. And um, it's, it's a complex conversation that's happening around um, what is the right way to you know, uh, to behave in this situation. I mean, it's just feels weird for folks who've been, uh, avoiding helicopters for years to now be in the position where they're being undercut by neighbors who didn't put money into getting regulated, didn't put work into doing track and trace and, and metric. And, uh, uh, I think that that, that story is something that deserves a lot more attention and, uh, uh, is just really fascinating and is, is something is a, a little micro um, example of something that I think is going is, you know, it's happening across the industry in other places as well. 
That was awesome. Thank you so much, man. Um, I would love to keep in touch with you. Um, have you back in a couple of months to give us an update on what's going on. You know, I, I really, I think what you're doing is really brilliant. Um, and I think that you going through Y Combinator is such a fundamentally different way that, that the industry is, is moving forward that it was really fast. I really wanted to talk to you. It was really fascinating. Thank you. That was really awesome. Uh, a special thanks to Ted Lichtenberger, CEO of Flower Company. You can find them on Twitter at Flower Company, or you can go to their website, which is flowercompany.com. As always, if you want to chat with us, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter uh, with the handle on Instagram. It's at the Green Rush underscore podcast. And on Twitter, you can find us at the underscore Green Rush. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher, whether it be on the Apple Podcast app, Google Play, or Stitcher, or wherever you're listening to us. Um, we really appreciate it. You can feel free to send us email to greenrush at KCSA. I'm still waiting for more hate mail. I, I really enjoy it. Um, and that's one take, Shay. One take.